Well, I'm very happy to take this opportunity to explore um, approaches to climate change policy from three rather different perspectives. And uh, uh, what, what, um, from Franklin, we'll be hearing something about kind of restructuring market incentives and contracts and the like. And from, uh, from Jose, we'll be hearing about natural solutions, inc including rainforest and the like. And then um, from, from David, we'll be hearing about solar ge geoengineering and perhaps other geoengineering challenges as well. Um, so let me start with David. I was, I was reading this um, article that you have did recently about basically surveying a whole bunch of people in the geosciences about, uh, about the future of geoscience research and the funding and what the priorities ought to be and everything. And um, it was interesting to see that there is not a huge necessarily consensus other than maybe research is a good idea. But uh, for, yeah, so for, so from your perspective, when you think about solar ge geoengineering, um, what are the best next steps? And so, so like how much research going forward is required to actually get uh, to, you know, to convince ourselves that this is a viable um, alternative? And like, what type of horizons are we thinking about and the like? I think on a, on a kind of purely technical basis, sort of research over even half a decade could actually do a lot. And the reason is this, well, it's, a, it's to some people still a new idea it's not really a new technology or new science, it's just an application of existing science and existing technology uh, to do this new task. And so that's why progress can in principle be pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And to give you like an example of that, um, this idea of putting sulfuric acid in the stratosphere and understanding stratospheric aerosols, this is in no way new. There's this immense amount of science. The first review article of stratospheric aerosols was published in 1960. This is a huge amount of knowledge. So I think it would certainly be worth doing, say, five or 10 years of, of a much broader research program. I think the big challenge is to think about why it is that people have such different views. So my view is that if a kind of cold read of literature, forgetting the politics, is if you're talking about stratospheric aerosol solar geoengineering in a way that's balanced between the hemispheres and that's only offsetting some of the radiative forcing, that there's actually very strong evidence that that would have very large benefits and the risks are reasonably well understood and, and quantitatively small. But obviously, many people don't share that view. And it's not clear that more evidence is the issue. It's not obvious why that view isn't shared. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's not just about research. I think it's about better assessment processes that can bring the community to something a little closer to consensus. What might be the Political challenges, how much cooperation is required across different political entities and governments and the like, is that, is, is that a big deal or is that... Uh, or is that... It's, a, it's, it's a huge deal. In some ways, obviously, it's, it's the central deal. Um, I think, I mean, as a technical matter, not much cooperation is needed. So uh, uh, many nations could, in principle, begin doing this without the, the sort of technical necessity in a supply chain sense to have uh, much cooperation. but. Obviously, nations will have very different views about whether this should happen. And the question is, what is the kind of stable coalition of countries that could implement some version of solar geoengineering? And there have been some kind of game theoretic exploration of that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a big gap between game theory and real world politics. And it's actually quite hard to judge what is politically hard or easy in this regard. Uh -huh. Maybe say one thing. I mean, we all think of it as being hard. And it, it probably is in some ways. But I mean, in general, difficulties in international affairs uh, come from misaligned interests. You know, the idea that I benefit sure. and you lose, and that right. makes it hard to make a deal. Right. But if it is really correct that most countries benefit from slowing the rate of temperature rise, and these risks are quite small, then the benefits might be pretty even, and the costs aren't very big. So a priori, you'd think that wouldn't be that hard to make a deal. But mm -hmm. I don't think that's the way it'll play out. So let me turn. Um to rainforest, natural solutions. Uh, so presumably we, we think of natural solutions as part part of a way to address climate change, not the whole way to address climate change. It's got limits to how far you, um, one can really push it. But Jose, can, can you give us an idea about what the, pros, the positive prospects might be for kind of preserving rainforests and how much help that will be in terms of addressing climate change and uh, yeah, other type of natural solutions? Sure. So. Uh, I know basically about the Amazon forest, and I know about the Brazilian Amazon forest. The Brazilian Amazon forest is 60% of the Amazon, 
which in turn is by far the largest tropical forest in the world. It's more than twice the size of the Congo forest, which is the second one. Now, just at the, so I'll talk about numbers that refer to the Brazilian, to, to the Brazilian portion of the Amazon forest. And just there, um, you, you can find two things uh, which are clear that, about the Brazilian Amazon. First, that it has been substantially deforested. So that about 15% of the territory of the old forest is gone. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, uh, uh, so in some sense that's horrible, but it's also a great opportunity because you could reforest this 15%. And to give you a quantitative, uh, an idea, right now, if Brazil, can, Brazil could, if, could capture in those 15% about 15 gigatons of, of, car, of CO2. And those 15 gigatons of CO2 uh, are, is a substantial number. You know, uh, these targets for, for uh, CO2 are always very mushy. Nobody yeah, really right. knows what they mean. Yeah. But a lot of people talk about how much should we get, should, can we put in the atmosphere uh, to avoid a 50% chance of, uh, of, uh, of a one and a half degree increase in temperature since the pre-industrial pre, pre times. I don't trust those numbers, but you can use them to, to kind of give you a ballpark number. And that's about probably as of today, that's about, I would say about uh, close to 7% seven, 7 of that number. Or if, mm -hmm. Yeah, 7%, 7 or 8% of the number. Mm -hmm. But in addition, the tropical forest in Brazil is now on a path that will, will probably go into the forest another 10%. So that's 25%. Uh, so that will make this total of 25 to so another another 15 gigatons of uh, carbon that is going to be produced by this deforestation, and that by itself, when added to the other one, says we're going to have a if we have a program for preserving and and reforesting, we we'll get 30 gigatons. That's a big number mm -hmm. from for and by the way, most of that in the next 15 years, 15 to 20 years. All these challenges, we can have government mandates, we can restructure um, financial incentives, we can do a variety of different things. What do you think is most effective and what's your way, what are you viewing as the, as the productive ways to go on this? So I guess my view is that the, the politics is becoming really difficult, even in places where yeah. you, there's a lot of natural voter support for it. So Europe traditionally has had a lot of support, but yeah. Even in Europe now, there's a lot of pushback. I mean, I guess it started with the gilet jaune in, in France, but yeah. it's, it's spread to Germany, it's come here. And so th there's a lot of watering down of proposals, pushing back of dates. And I, I think the more people are exposed to the actual costs of doing many of these policies, it's gonna be a bigger and bigger problem to actually get things done. Yeah. So the kinds of things we were just hearing about in terms of emission trading schemes and so on, they potentially can work quite well, but there's a lot of, a lot of opposition to many of those kinds of things. If we look at the other main area where we see a lot of movement towards climate initiatives, it's in the finance area. And what's interesting about finance is that you don't have the same kind of political issues. It can be cross-border, it can do a lot of the things we were just talking about a few minutes ago, that uh, it, it, it can worry about what's happening in the emerging countries and so mm -hmm. on. And so that makes it a, a very powerful way of doing things because you don't need to reach agreement. <laughs> and it, as long as there are enough people who are willing to actually put their financial resources behind changing things, then we can make progress without having to worry in, about politics in this, the way we, we were just discussing across all of these yeah. issues, I think. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I can push you to be a little bit more uh, specific about the nature of the type of financial innovations or changes which you think would help here. 
So one of the one of the yeah. most interesting ones. So that there's a lot of green bonds and so on, but th yeah. those are not really enforced very well. That they don't write contracts which are actually yeah. enforceable. So it's a lot of greenwashing yeah. and stuff. Right. But there, there's another set of instruments are out there which are based on contingent payments, where you interest rate on bonds, for example, depends on the emissions the firm makes in terms of CO2 yeah. as one illustration. And interestingly, th those, are, those are much more effective because actually the benefit the firm gets it depends directly on what the uh, actions they take are in terms of reducing emissions. Mm. And there's about a trillion dollars of that out there in the markets at the moment. So it's, it's an order of magnitude, which is still way too small, but it's much larger than the kinds of amounts of money that governments can provide and so on, which is more in the tens or hundreds of billions, which is even, yeah. even that's very contentious to come up yeah. with those kinds of, of, of amounts. So I, I think it's, it's an area where we can make significant progress. It, it's not, you know, we, what, what we've done in our research is to show that there's equivalence between that and things like trading schemes and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you need, you need people who actually want it. But at some level, we have to have either politically or in terms of what people are willing to pay yeah. to, uh, agreement that this is something we need to do. So if I try to contrast your ideas with um, so-called ESG investing, which has got a whole lot of attention. So is this meant as alternative to that? People interested in addressing climate change can do it in a more effective way than this? That's the way I think about it, uh -huh. yeah. A lot of ESG, Financing is, yeah. you know, we're talking about greenwashing in yeah, bonds, right, yeah. but also in equities. But yeah. I think this is a much more effective right. way of doing things yeah. because, or, or, you know, there are issues about measurement, but that's yeah. true with all of all of these kinds of policy sure. like trading schemes. Yeah. But but once you've got that those things in place, you actually have good incentives for for firms to do to do this and. As I say, it can go cross border. It can go yeah. to the emerging economies, which is where the real problem is. And Europe is yeah. what seven, eight percent of the problem. The UK is one percent. Um, US is, is thirteen, but then China's thirty, over thirty percent. So it, it's really there that a lot of the issues are. And India and so on. So let me now go back to to um, to Jose, and we can talk about well. If I understand your research, you're saying that from an economic standpoint, the cost of making substantial cha changes in the, um, in the in the rainforest land all allocations are really not all that large. How do we then translate that into feasible policies? Well, first of all, you do understand the research because you are contributor. To <laughs> <laughs> so that's an easy. You can't take any effort. <laughs> Uh, but uh, getting, to the, uh, getting to the point, there are two questions about tropical forests which are important. One is enforcement. So how do you enforce programs like this? A lot of those programs, so-called voluntary programs, again, there's a lot of, of these programs that really don't work because they're not enforced. It's very expensive to enforce. And understanding the Brazilian experience on this is very important. It's cheap to enforce it at scale. Okay. The science also tells you that you want to do it at scale because of so-called edge effects mm -hmm. that are very important in, in climate. That is, if you have a preserved area close to an area which is not preserved and there is some kind of human activity, then that area becomes less capable of capturing carbon. It would take us a while to discuss why, but that's well understood. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to do it at scale. And scale, they, you're talking about countries which have a low level of governance. So the countries having somewhat to enforce that. And enforcing at scale is cheap. Enforcing in detail split areas is very expensive. So that's the first thing. So if you want to do it at scale, you have to have the goodwill of the current governments or have them to have a big monetary stake on it. Mm -hmm. So my view is that for a country like Brazil, if there was a program in which there were transfers, either financed by private companies or by governments, et cetera, of the other $25 a, a, a ton of CO2, which is a very low level relative to what programs like this cost nowadays, um, it, would be, it would be 
it would take a, a really crazy government, even crazier than our last government, <laughs> say, okay, we don't want that money. <laughs> Just let's not have it. Because the problem with tropical forests and the Amazon in particular is that the alternative use is really, really, really bad. So that the Amazon has been, the region of the Amazon has been the lowest growth area in Brazil and the per capita income in the Amazon is the lowest in Brazil yeah. and the typical work in the sector, in the, most of the land is being used for very low productivity cattle. The typical worker in this sector is paid um, about $200 a month, which is low even by Brazilian standards. So that's there's not much of an opportunity cost. It's different than in other sectors where there are some people really making money out of it. In this case, you're not making money out of it. Yeah. So that's another good thing about the opportunity. Now, you do have to think the economics, the finance, in how to set incentives so that as the program goes through, the government of Brazil has no, has no desire to break the program. Mm -hmm. Because of one fact about tropical forests is that the more you reforest, the less additional carbon you're going to capture. There's an equilibrium. Yeah. at the end. Yeah. And, but I think it's something that could be done, but you have to take international cooperation, and it's not something that can be done entirely by the private sector. The private sector can come in, in both the financing side and also on doing the, ref you know, their methods for reforestation, which are more, more efficient than passive reforestation. All that can be done by the private sector, but you, have, you need agreements at enforcement level governments. Yeah. Yeah, so this, um, let me push things in a little bit different direction now. Um, research and development, okay? So we can think about research and development. We want to incentivize companies to do, you know, R&D. And in fact, I, I personally think for a lot of renewable stuff, that might be the best way to be doing it. It's going to be, you know, private sector type, you know, type of incentives. And, but, but the other thing for some of the, it seems like for some of the more um, research support that uh, David was talking about, maybe governments do have to be involved. So first of all, on these kind of financial incentive schemes, um, how much explicit encouragement or implicit encouragement in that is for firms to engage in R&D? So arguably, dirty firms might be the ones right now that uh, have the biggest incentive to engage in R&D and the like, which is one of the problems people have identified with ESG investing. But so uh, are these same financial incentives you're talking about going to encourage the type of R&D we want from the private sector. And then, then I'm going to turn to David about private sector versus R&D versus the government. Yes, I mean, I think, I think it, it, it depends on, on how you, you structure things. But if you issue long-term bonds, for example, yeah. which have these kinds of uh, <laughs> contingencies of, of reducing uh, carbon emissions, yeah. if it's a 30-year bond, then R&D is, is, is definitely something that's worth doing mm -hmm. uh, to bring these things down. So yeah. yes, I think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think R&D is a big part of it, but private sector incentives are, are yeah. a better way to go uh -huh. in many cases. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really depends on the kind of good. So for goods that are, I think, sort of encapsulated goods like solar panels we were discussing earlier, I think private sector R&D is absolutely the way to go because yeah. at some level, being a little simplistic, I don't care that much about the supply chain for solar power. Of course, there's ways that I do. I really just care about the product, and it's easy to, to measure the product. If you yeah. sell me mm -hmm. a billion dollars of solar panels, I can tell what they do. Right. I, so I think for that kind of thing, capitalism is the answer. I think where it gets much harder is for things where it's really about long-term trust, where it's really hard to measure the outcomes exactly, and when the core thing we're buying is kind of trust information. So in the case of, say, m monitoring carbon storage in the Amazon or solar geoengineering, I kind of think I don't want, I mean, there's room for private action, but I think those are fundamentally public goods that we're paying for. They're really complicated things. Like, like It's like privatizing education. It's actually very hard to measure these things in the long run. And, and you need the kind of transparency that I think public institutions provide. So I see that as a place where you need more public action. Can I, can I ask Go a question? On, please. So to do the kinds of thing you were talking about with, with the stratosphere and things, yeah. what kinds of costs are you talking about there? I mean, are, are these 
tens of billions, hundreds of billions, trillions? No, more like billions. Billions. Uh, yeah. So the costs are very low. The costs are low enough that the costs aren't the big deal. The big deal is really confidence in what the results are, these issues of, of really how, what we believe about whether these things will work. Yeah. But the direct cost of doing them appears to be quite low. Yeah. But the, the evidence is that it works and the risks are low. Yeah, the evidence that it would reduce temperatures is extraordinarily high yeah. in my view. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th that evidence really spans kind of half a century, yeah. mm -hmm. many major reports, including like a recent one from UNEP called the One Atmosphere Report, back that up. Um, I think what the risks are depend on exactly what we're doing. That's one of the, the, the problems is, is that solar geoengineering, there are certainly things you could do that would be highly risky. It's not a single thing, it's a set of choices. I think the point is there are choices we could make that the risks really do appear to be quite low. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems to me like one reason people kind of have fear of new innovative solutions or technologies and the like is maybe there's unintended consequences that we haven't anticipated and all of a sudden we spring them. Um, is, is that a concern here or? Um... It, it's certainly a concern, but of course this really isn't a new solution. The 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 very first major report on climate change yeah. that went to a top political leader, went to President Johnson when I was two years old, and this was yeah. the only solution. Yeah, fair it. enough. Uh, uh, and a bunch of the core science of this has been there. It was yeah. in there in the National Academy Report of 1977, yeah. Yeah. the 1984 Academy Report. These are not new things. So, so I think, let me turn that around. If somebody had some completely new tech idea for solving yeah. climate change that was unconnected with previous science, I'd be highly skeptical, but that's not the case here. Sulfur in the stratosphere is something where we have this immense amount of knowledge, partly because we put up to 120 million tons a year of sulfur in the lower atmosphere with huge consequences for air pollution and so on, but that also means immense amount of science. I mean, we're sitting in London where the first sulfur scrubber on the a power plant was in, in the 1880s, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so there's a long history of managing sulfur. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can I ask a question for Franklin? Sure. Because I didn't have a chance to look. Actually, Brazil has green bonds now. But I remember the first two issues I heard of were issued by Chile and Uruguay. And the premium, the implicit price on the CO2 that you could derive for it was extremely low. Is that, is that, that, has that market gotten better for that? Because, you know, you have to look at first the, the spread that sells over the usual bonds and then the... So, so the problem. With the premium out of it. Yeah, I mean the problem was initially it was when interest rates were near zero. So, <laughs> right. You know, and you, they weren't willing at that stage to go into negative rates. And, and I, the, not for Uruguay and 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 Chile. <laughs> I understand what you, they were low. They were low, but I think now interest rates are back to more normal levels. We we need we we haven't actually done anything in the last year or a couple of years to look at right. that, what's happening. But That's an interesting question. Yeah, it's See, very important. What's the implicit CO2 capital yeah. price that people are enjoying out of, uh, out of that? Mm. So, so I think about climate change, it seems to me like going forward, China and India are gonna be big players. I mean, yeah, suppose Europe gets this acting gear, which it seems to be ahead of the rest of the game on this. It seems like at, at, at the end of the day, it's a pretty small input into the solution. Um, so how much, are the, how much optimism do you have about these same type of financial type schemes you're talking about working for uh, China and India and the like going forward? So I was just in China a couple of weeks ago, yeah. which was, was very interesting. And, and one of the things uh, was discussed a lot was climate finance. So, you know, it's, it's this very strange mixture. So on one hand, they're doing awful lot of things. So if you look at renewables, they dominate in solar panels, yeah. Yeah. in turbines, all of those things. Yeah. You're on the streets at Beijing or, or Shanghai, about half the cars are electric cars. Mm -hmm. And then they have this, you know, the local pollution problem is still there. So yeah. it's gotten better. So in, Be in Beijing, you know, it was alternate between the usual kind of smog to these beautiful spring days yeah. with blue skies of the kind I haven't seen for a long time. And so, you know, it's, it's a strange place that way. So they are very serious about, very serious yeah. about climate finance and providing incentives, but at the same time, you know, the, the China National Coal Company is 13% of global emissions. So, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's right. an amazing contradiction. Yeah. And even though China is by far the m largest contributor to installation of, of solar panels, 
It's also, it does, in China, the growth of electricity capacity that comes from coal at this point is larger than the one from solar panel. So, so it's it, all this amazing number of solar panels, yeah. but even more coal-fired facilities. So one of the interesting things though, was they had this discussion that we started, they started talking about green coal. So <laughs> they have these different views on coal, which I mean, what this essentially is, is that different types of coal have different emissions. And yeah. if, if you go to towards the, the, the lighter emission spectrum, it's, it's more like gas and things. So, so there, you know, there's sensitivity, but it's yeah. true. I mean, it's, you've got this tremendous, and when you raise it to them, they, they kind of understand it, but it is, it's, it's a great paradox yeah. they have there. But frankly, you shouldn't be surprised. There are, there are Western oil companies selling something they call green gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> and advertising it. <laughs> Frankly, so, I'm you know, they, I don't know who learned from whom, but we, there is such a thing as green gasoline. <laughs> Franklin, I'm interested in, in the, you know, you had that, an if statement. I mean, there's no question that finance can have huge power, but the if statement is obviously if people want to spend that extra amount of money that's beyond just their normal return or, or their normal utility. And, and obviously, I agree that if statement is there for regulation too. But I think if I think about the history of environmental regulation, where for air and water pollution in much of the rich world and China, we've made enormous progress. Mm -hmm. And with peak costs of like the US uh, Clean Air Act, peak cost was close to 1% of GDP, so big costs. Those were all by regulation. And then mm -hmm. capitalism to compete on it, and it worked. I mean, persuade me why on earth we're going to take a couple percent of GDP, which is what it takes to really decarbonize quickly, and just kind of do that without a government incentive. Like, what's going to make how can finance really do much beyond what government force does? Well, the problem with government is that the amounts of monies that they're willing to put into it is tens to hundreds of billions. So this, you know, there was this fund to give a hundred billion to the emerging economies, yeah. and they didn't get to that even after, you know, yeah. I think it was two thousand and nine, yeah. two thousand and nine COP that was agreed. So that, that's a tiny amount of money. But what, what, what's required is trillions of dollars to finance all of these kinds of things. Com completely agree, but I'm not saying government should just pay, but, but in, those, in the analogy yeah. of what we did for, for, for lead or ozone or, or, or air pollution, it wasn't government money pouring out dominantly, it was rules. It said, you know, if you want to be in this market, you have to have less sulfur emissions than X. And then, then th those rules forced big flows of money, and I guess are you proposing that these big flows of money will happen without rules? And if yes, so, that, that's the, because, yeah. so if you look in Europe, for example, I think that the usual figure is something like 75% of, of inve investment funds have ESG mandates. So the, the, we're talking about trillions and trillions of euros. And so that the, these amounts are enormous. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I agree fully with you that r regulation yeah. would be great if, if everybody wants to do it. But the yeah. problem is Trump gets in. First thing he does is cancel the Paris Agreement yeah. from the U.S. And, you know, it, what, what's going to happen yeah. if he does get in in November? You yeah. know, that's, that's the problem. But I agree with you. For, I mean, what the U.S. did, you know, over the last 50 years, it got rid of lead and gasoline. They did all the clean yeah. water. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. But then there's this other, you know, if you look at, yeah. you know, <laughs> other areas and it, it's, you know, the way Biden tried to do it with the Inflation Reduction Act is, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, there's lost, there's billions of, hundreds of billions of dollars, yeah. but it's still a small fraction of actually what you would need to, to do it that way. Agreed, so, but, I, but the so ESG, the matter, oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious, the question is, is yes, there's, whatever your number is, you know the right number, trillion dollars or something of funds that are nominally ESG, but the amount of actual new real flows to actual efficient capital of, uh, uh, for carbon reduction from those feels to me very small, but I don't know the number. So that, that, that gets to Jose's question yeah. about, you know, yeah. if you look at the implicit price of carbon in these yeah. things, it's small. Yeah. So it's a start. I mean, these are all, yeah. Yeah. are all things. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is really interesting because it's quite cheap if it's, we're talking about yeah. billions yeah. of dollars. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, I, I understand that people worry about these risks probably much more than, you know, they're very risk about them because they're, they're sort of unknown <laughs> risks. To be clear, what I'm talking about doesn't get us out of the long-term need to decarbonize. In the end, yeah. if you don't bring net emissions to zero, the climate warms without bounds. So you have to decarbonize. 
Solar geoengineering can reduce risks along with decarbonization, but it can't fully substitute for decarbonization. But it gives us a lot more time, as it I gives us more time. It can. Yeah. That's what I think we need at this point. We do need, I joke about it, to <coughs> wait for Bill Gates' magic machine that's going to capture it from the, from the air. And it may come, yeah. but it's not well, going to come tomorrow. Well, they have them in Iceland. Yeah, it's not going to come tomorrow, yeah. It's not yeah. going to come tomorrow it's at any reasonable expensive. price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but, and I do think that uh, governments are spending money for whatever, when they're spending money in, in the form of incentives, you gave the example of the IRA, at least there's some political consensus at the moment they could do it. I wish they would do it in a more efficient way. Yeah. And that's part of the problem. But there was a political consensus that approved, you know, a lot of money for, for taking care of, of, of CO2. So I don't think that's, uh, you're right. I mean, you always have the risk of Trump or, or what could happen in Europe in the next elections. What, or what happened in Brazil with the last government. Or what happened in Brazil with the last government. So all those things, we, we, we run the risk. So that's why I agree, you know, in some sense those things, it is a big question of how can government interest in this can structure things in such a way they will be hard for those people to get out of. Yeah. And I think that's a great, in the end, it's a finance question. It's the kind of question we ask in finance, you know, how to set up the right incentives for the parties. Yeah. And it's mostly corporate, which is an area that you contributed a lot to. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, is something we have to think about a lot. And one of the sessions that I'm looking forward to most is the fusion session because that does seem a technology yeah. which could be 30, 40 years away, but could be closer, actually. I was talking to one of my colleagues who's, who's uh, chairman of, um, who is chairman of the UK uh, Atomic Energy Authority for a while, mm -hmm. but he's now chairing a, um, a company, private sector companies, which are gonna develop fusion reactors. So they're still, we're many years from, from yeah. them being practical in terms of actually generating energy, but on the time scales of 30, 40 years, we may, I mean, I remember as a child, which was well before Joseph. <laughs> but but what you're likely to end up looking with, at those things. it's not clear those things will really be that different from existing nuclear power in terms of capital costs. So I, for, for 10 or 15 years, I, I and a couple others actually ran meetings for Bill Gates. It was really fun because you, when you invite people to build meetings, they, almost nobody says no. So I, one of the last meetings I ran was a big fusion meeting for Bill. Yeah. and and. Uh, I actually, my first job was in laser fusion in high school. I, okay. I started in physics. So it's not like I'm anti it, but but I, I think it it's getting to make power is a doable thing. But getting to make power at an interesting price, I don't think there's any kind of clear pathway to do it. It's a very long way off. And it's not as if we don't know how to make large central station, high cost, uh, uh, but carbon free power plants with conventional fission power. And it's not as if the Fusion power solves some obvious problem that fission power had. There are certainly some. So I am I do think it will happen. There's some variants that might happen, but I don't think it's, I think it's much less transformational. And I think it matters much less than it did a few years ago, because now we can build giant scale solar at low cost and we can move power long distances. And so it gets incrementally less important. So, I mean, if we were to use solar, how much would that cost? in terms of percent of GDP, do you think, if we were to make that transition? Well, the big question is how you move, so, so I mean, the, the raw cost of making solar energy now is in, in really sunny places at these industrial gigawatt scale things is ridiculously cheap. Uh, um, I think the challenge is how we use that. So the challenge is how much we do really long distance transmission, which is technically possible. I mean, there are people looking into a major thing that would power 5% or so of the UK with an undersea line from Morocco, for example. There's a line that's being looked at between uh, Australia and Singapore. These things are technically doable, uh, s but, but they're politically tough in a, in a world like this. Uh, storage is getting cheaper, but there's not a simple way. Obviously, solar power doesn't magically make airplanes go or turn the lights on at night. You have to have storage or, or transmission. Mm -hmm. But I think those things are movable, and having the underlying ability to make really cheap primary energy uh, is, is the core. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, it, it uh, at least my thinking about that has really changed with solar just getting so cheap. And the fission reactors, how, how expensive are the fission reactors? Well, on paper, they're good. But if you look at the actual experience, obviously in, in the West right now, it, it's, it's horrific. So you've got, 
you're trying to finish up a build in the UK, um, and it's now over 15,000 per KW, and prices are going up and it's not done. There's two in the US, one abandoned. There's Okalito three in Finland, and there's the, the new France one. They're all very high. I guess Okalito now is grid connected, if I'm up to date. But all of those are um, you know, well over 10,000 bucks a KW. Uh, Korea has held prices better, and I think China has. But still, prices went up there and are high. So it, it, I, think, I think the question is why? And, yeah. and, and there's no simple answer. It's like, kind of like a bad marriage where everybody blames everybody else. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 we obviously did build a lot of the US fleet. So people have done retroactive studies. The cost to build the US fleet in current dollars was like 2,500, 3,000 bucks a KW. And if you could do that now, you'd say that's great. And, and we did that in the 70s. So why can't we do it now? I don't know. So I guess um, two things. One is governmental solutions. A problem with governments is they tend to be short-sighted. And so how do you structure these things to think, think longer? I mean, I mean, some of these contractual arrangements and arrangements that you have to ensure people follow incentives seems to require governments that with a little bit willing to take a longer view of things. Uh, is, is, is this going to really be in the cards? And then when Frank was talking about all this demand for ESG investing, um, I, I agree with that, but the, but the thing we don't know right now is currently the amount of money they're losing for the uh, in, investing green is not, uh, she, people are having a hard time to measure it. And, 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 she, and, and they may view it as very, very low now because there's because not enough evidence to figure out that it's high. If we, if we down the road we start figuring out that that's high, then I, I, I wonder whether the ESG enthusiasm doesn't vanish quickly. But um, I, 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 I mean, I would love to see Governments have, having the right incentives, and I'd love to see private sectors kind of jumping in and doing the right things too. But is it how much optimism does this require? Yeah, I mean, I think that at the moment it, ESG investing doesn't work well, but hopefully yeah. over time the private sector incentives to show what works and what doesn't work will. No, I, I, so let me be clear. I wasn't going to endorse ESG investing. I was just going to say you, you were using evidence that, that that people are willing to sacrifice returns uh, in ESG investing. So, so why, why wouldn't they also be willing to do it in your kind of economically more sensible way? And, and, and I guess my my view of that is I'm not sure how much yet people are willing to sacrifice their financial returns yeah. for ESG. No, I mean that's <laughs> that's, that's a problem. But it's the, it's the same problem with the politics that right. they're not willing. Really, precisely. Like, precisely. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Agree, but, you know, I think it has a lot to do with how much people are suffering the, the consequences. Yes. I think the Clean Water Air Act, it was a time when people were realizing that life was really hard without some kind of regulation. Yeah. yeah. So, paradoxically, you know, all this climate, uh, this, this weather problems we've been having lately, yeah. it may help whether they are really Truly, a question, a consequence of climate change or not? Uh, yeah, I, I, right, right. This year, I agree. But it, can help, it may help, help to rest, create right. a certain consensus that uh, you know would allow governments to to have policies. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's it's you know doing the things on 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 lead was also non-trivial. Yeah. You know, regulation lead, taking lead out of gasoline, prices went up of gasoline. Yeah. Yeah. But for yeah. whatever reason, people didn't complain a lot about yeah. it. And uh, I do think that that's, that's, unfortunately, you know, if the people who predict that the climate disaster is going to arrive earlier than we thought it would, yeah. that may help. If they're right, it may help. That, that seems to be like this contest between once we see the damages, we'll convince the people of it. Right. But but they do they have to see so much damages that it's very hard to reverse the uh, yeah. right. reverse the implication that, at that point uh, in time. That's that's the so there's kind of a race going on here. Yeah, I think. yeah. <laughs> see who wins it's that very one. Very disappointing, just depressing race. Yeah. Yeah, it is a depressing thought, but yeah. maybe that's the only way you can get things to. Anyway, yeah. with that, maybe we should close. <laughs> it's better to close out a pessimistic mouth. No, no, actually, let, let, let me add a little bit more. more. Let, me, <laughs> let me let people make some type of closing statement about their perspectives. I want to ask a really good this. economist here. I, I, so, so I, as you can tell, I'm really a skeptic that this ESG thing is solvable because I think the incentives for people to, to, to there's always more highly paid smart people who are going to 
who are going to trick me that, as an investor. That, and I, and w whereas, if we just price carbon where it enters in the economy, it's really easy to do. The accounting's trivial. You just price it where it enters, no complexity. Obviously, the challenge is government's doing that in their areas. So I, I've always been kind of persuaded by Nordhaus's idea of climate clubs. The, the challenge is go each government wants to do it, obviously, but there's a leakage problem, and the issue is how you persuade other governments to go along, and this idea of kind of climate clubs where, where fundamentally you have trade barriers that say if, if, if you're a reluctant country, we'll impose some trade barriers, and that, that that's how this spreads in the absence of some global sovereign, which obviously we don't have. I've been pretty persuaded by Nordhaus's underlying argument. I guess I'd love I to I do hear think there's, a, there's a better way of doing this. Yeah. I really believe in consumption, carbon-based consumption taxes. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be so impossible to design. And that gives you the right incentive. So Europe could put a very yeah. high, yeah. and then Europeans effectively won by from countries that that are using a lot of, yeah. producing a lot of yeah. carbon. But that would be a much better way because, you know, somebody that really needs that stuff would just pay the tax. Yeah. Yeah. You know, instead yeah. of just yeah. banning uh, exports. But I do think that this whole idea of trying to agree on a, on a, on a carbon tax on industry across countries, yeah. that's not what's not going I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, the problem is when we're moving away from a free trade world <laughs> to a world where we're going to be very much in, yeah. in groups. But yeah. I mean, I guess I, I'm very um, glad to hear the kinds of technological solutions that you're talking yeah. about, yeah. because right. I mean, that's, I that's where the future is. And if we've got 30 <laughs> or 40 years of yeah. people, I mean, if you think the, the, yeah. the progress in solar and wind term is just yeah. amazing, yeah. and no one would have really predicted that t yeah. 20 There's years. also been a lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of progress in, on renewables too. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things going on that could help us, but we do need more time and eventually, but yes. in any case, we will need at some point to reach zero net yep, we emissions. Have to. And that, that would still depend on some kind of yeah. policies or, or the private sector, whatever. But it, we still is independent of the technological advance. Agreed. OK, well, very good. I appreciate all the uh, exchanges. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to hear these various different approaches and what their strengths and weaknesses are. So thank you very much.